In the space of 100 years, Qatar has gone from being a poor country with a primitive economy to one of the richest in the world. It is no secret that much of their fortune has been the result of the large amount of oil reserves that it boasts. The black gold liquid has provided the Qatari royal family an opportunity to modernize its realm, as well as exerting their influence on a global level. The immense amounts of money brought in by oil and gas has subsequently been used by the ruling Al Thani family to establish more economically sustainable strategies that will serve Qatar in remaining a hub for commercial interest in the years to come. Qatar is a relatively small peninsula that extends from the Arabian Peninsula into the Persian Gulf. It developed into an emirate during the second half of the 19th century, despite having to deal with Bahraini incursions into its territory. It was ruled by the Al Thani family, which under Muhammad bin Thani had become the ruling house of Qatar. From the 1870s until the onset of World War I, the Ottomans forced the Al Thanis to accept their authority. By 1916, Emir Abdullah bin Jassim allowed Qatar to become a British protectorate, largely because of guarantees from the British that they would protect his realm from foreign aggression. At the start of the British protectorate, Qatar was very primitive economically. Oil had not yet been discovered and the profitable pearl trade it relied upon was collapsing. It also had territorial disputes with nearby Bahrain, leading the Bahrainis to place a trade embargo on Qatar. But late in 1939, the country's fate would be changed forever when drilling at a well in Dukhan struck oil. Like with many other Middle Eastern countries, the actual drilling was carried out by the British via the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, which had gotten a concession from Emir Abdullah bin Jassim in return for a fee. Over the next few years, more wells were discovered. But before the country could get excited about how lucky it was, World War II put an end to field operations and drilling completely. This period saw Qataris endure extreme economic hardships, with many immigrating to other parts of the Persian Gulf. But the dark financial days would pass. After the war was over, drilling resumed and by 1949, Qatar was ready to start exporting its oil to the rest of the world. On December 31st, the first shipment saw 80,000 tons of oil being carried by ship to Europe. At this stage, Qatar was producing almost 34,000 barrels of oil per day. By 1954, this increased threefold. The profit also increased noticeably. In 1950, it earned $1 million from oil revenue, whereas by 1954, this figure amounted to $23 million. This was thanks to a new agreement signed in 1952 between Qatar and the British, which brought about a 50-50 split in profit. The Al Thani family now received a much needed and generous injection of revenue to fund their vision for developing their state. It's hard for a government to survive on money alone. Without an adequate infrastructure, it is incapable of dealing with challenges to its authority. As well as being economically underdeveloped, the country's political and administrative structure was very basic, functioning as an outgrowth of tribal politics. So the ruler at the time, Ali bin Abdullah, used British advisors to help improve the development of government structures and basic public services. As the country's infrastructure developed, so too did its ability to produce oil, thereby increasing revenue. In the 1960s, Qatar received a very pleasant surprise when large offshore gas fields were discovered off its coast. This meant that in addition to its vast oil reserves, Qatar also has the third largest proven reserves of gas in the world. Consequently, the Qatari royal family was now receiving hundreds of millions of dollars annually from exports. 
These funds were bolstered during the 1970s. First, because of the hike in oil prices in the aftermath of the 1973 oil crisis, when many Arab countries raised the price of oil in response to Western support for Israel. And secondly, because in the aftermath of its independence from Britain in 1971, Qatar completely nationalized its oil and gas industries by 1977. The vast amounts of wealth accrued allowed its ruler Khalifa bin Hamad to pour money into the country's social programs such as housing, health and education. A key long-term development that was taking place in the background to all of this was that more and more of Qatar's ruling elites were having their sons educated in prominent Western institutions. So as a result, what we see is a gradual and cautious move among the elite to liberalize the society and economy. Emir Hamad bin Khalifa really was the first ruler to assertively establish Qatar's presence in regional and even global politics. For example, he established the now major news network Al Jazeera, as well as bidding to host numerous prominent sporting events such as the 2022 Football World Cup. Economically, the most important action he took was to empower the country's sovereign wealth fund, the Qatar Investment Authority, or the QIA. This was done so that Qatar wouldn't be completely dependent on its oil and gas reserves which, whilst being some of the largest in the world, would invariably run out over the coming decades. The QIA has sought to diversify into new assets, such as investing in major property holdings across the world. For example, did you know that the QIA own at least 20% of Heathrow Airport in London, as well as owning the French football club Paris Saint-Germain? In addition to all of this, it has also expanded into the manufacturing industry becoming a major regional producer of steel, petrochemicals and fertilizers. This diversification has somewhat insulated it from the inevitable end of its oil and gas exports. But perhaps the most consequential action taken is the government initiative known as Qatarization, whereby the Al Thani family is targeting to make 50% of the workforce in the industry and energy sector Qatari citizens as well as increasing the overall amount of Qataris in management roles. So, because it still has huge oil and gas reserves, as well as the QIA investing large amounts of money into other major projects, and the fact that its leadership is becoming attuned to the economic and social needs required in a modern world, Qataris can feel confident that their nation's status as one of the richest in the world will likely continue for the foreseeable future. Thank you guys for watching, and a special thank you goes out to my Patreons for continuing to support me financially. If you want to do so, click the link in the end screen or in the description to this video, and I would appreciate it a lot. Whatever contribution you can make, that would be awesome. And if you're interested in the history of the modern Middle East, I'm making a playlist called Making of the Modern Middle East. So click the link in the end screen to check out all the other videos. I'm sure you'll enjoy at least some of them, if not all of them. Until next time, peace.